Voilà, goedemorgen allemaal. Uh, welkom. Uh, ik zie een aantal mensen in de chat. Goedemorgen. goedemorgen. Uh, welkom op dit uh, webinar um, rond uh, AI. Um, een enorme hype op dit moment. Ja, mijn naam is Lien Lene. Voor de mensen die mij niet, nog niet zouden kennen, maar ik denk dat de meesten mij wel kennen. Maar mijn naam is Lien Lene. Verantwoordelijk voor onderwijs binnen Microsoft. En, um, en toch wel heel blij uh, deze ochtend met het nieuws dat er gisteravond is gekomen. Dus, um, we gaan, uh, dus de bedoeling van dit webinar was eigenlijk om eens te gaan kijken wat zijn de mogelijkheden die, die er vandaag al zijn voor het creëren van onder andere chatbot uh, in hoger uh, onderwijs. Ik, praat, ik realiseer me dat ik Nederlands aan het praten ben. Uh, maar dat is oké okay voor iedereen, denk ik. Uh, misschien ook een vraag van Virginie. Het is oké okay dat het in het Nederlands is. Virginie is een collega van mij. Uh, ik ben even aan het kijken. Uh, ik stel uh, net de vraag in de chat. Ah, voilà, perfect. Misschien dat we dat toch even, even afwachten. Uh, ik denk dat we voor, voornamelijk met een uh, Nederlandstalig... Uh, publiek uh, zitten. Um, dus ik, ik denk, ik ga door in het Nederlands. Antoine uh, isn't so... <laughs> ja, Antoine isn't. Oké, okay, so, so, okay, so we switch to English. Oké, okay, goed. Oké. Okay. No, 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 do your intro in, uh, in Dutch, it's fine. I can, I can understand. Oké, okay, oké, okay, wel. Oké, okay. so, decision made. Ik ga door in het Nederlands. Antoine straks is onze expert op het vlak van uh, OpenAI en hij gaat uh, de presentatie in het Engels doen. Uh, voilà, dus um, even de waarvoor dat we vandaag hier zijn. Um, en dus jullie hebben gezien dat er uh, zijn vandaag heel veel mogelijkheden zijn, uh, zeker ook in onderwijs, met het creëren van, van, van chatbots. En we wilden vandaag daar eens wat dieper op ingaan om wat praktische voorbeelden te geven, uh, te tonen hoe dat chatbots eigenlijk kunnen gebruikt worden in onderwijs. En daarvoor heb ik mijn uh, collega Antoine Brommans, die jullie daar uh, verder gaat in begeleiden. En dat is eigenlijk het hoofdtopic uh, van, van de sessie uh, vandaag. Dus Antoine gaat straks praten over het creëren van chatbots met behulp van OpenAI. En OpenAI is, uh, zoals dat jullie weten, of misschien nog niet weten, is de functionaliteit die vandaag in Azure beschikbaar is. Dus in jullie Azure tenant kunnen jullie vandaag, uh, zien jullie vandaag een functionaliteit OpenAI die jullie de mogelijkheid geeft om chatbot, chatbots te genereren. Dus dat is eigenlijk het hoofddoel of het hoofdthema van de sessie vandaag. En dat ga ik uh, heel graag overlaten aan een expert en dat is het. Dus daar gaan we straks binnen vijf minuutjes verder op ingaan. Maar ik, uh, ik uh, hijack de agenda even om uh, wat toelichting te geven over uh, een aankondiging die er gisteravond uh, is gekomen. Zoals dat jullie weten hebben wij al een... Um, um, en ik denk dat jullie heel veel moeite hebben moeten doen om de Copilot hype te missen. Er is heel veel uh, over Copilot al gezegd de afgelopen uh, maanden, dagen en, uh, en weken. En uh, wij, wij bleven een beetje stil. Uh, jammer genoeg uh, bleef het een beetje stil rond aankondigingen wat betreft Copilot voor onderwijs. Nu, die stilte is doorbroken gisteren. Uh, de reden waarom dat we... Um, ja, waarom dat we daar niet eerder uh, na aankondiging over gedaan en over gesproken hebben, was uh, voornamelijk ook omdat uh, dat we wilden kijken hoe dat we dat het best ook kunnen klaarmaken voor onderwijs. Rekening houden met de specifieke context voor onderwijs. Zijnde dat dat niet alleen gaat over volwassenen, uh, maar het gaat ook over studenten. Studenten al dan niet plus 18, maar ook uh, studenten jonger dan 18. Van, dus vandaar dat ik even kort een update wil geven vandaag over wat is er nu eigenlijk gisteren aangekondigd. Um, we kennen allemaal uh, waarschijnlijk uh, de Copilot, uh, Copilot, Microsoft Copilot is eigenlijk gebaseerd, zoals dat jullie weten of niet weten, op de ChatGPT4 GPT uh, modellen en, en de DALI uh, E3 modellen, hè, dus de, wat dat dan meer de, de beelden zijn eigenlijk. Um, daar is eigenlijk Copilot op gebaseerd. En dat is, was al beschikbaar in, uh, dus dat stukje was wel al beschikbaar 
voor, uh, voor faculty. Um, hè, dus de, de gewone co-pilot was al beschikbaar. Um, belangrijk opmerking daar om te maken is dat, um, uh, dat, we, dat, dat die co-pilot, de, dus de, de, de input die jullie daar geven, de output die er gegeven wordt, alle interacties die er met co-pilot uh, mogelijk zijn, um, dat dat... Uh, de omgeving, allee, dat, dat, uh, voor, allee, dat dat beschermd is en dat wij dat ook voor geen enkele uh, trainingsdoeleinden gebruiken. Dus jullie um, data uh, of de activiteiten die jullie doen in Copilot is beschermd. Die data wordt niet bewaard en die data wordt ook niet gebruikt om de modellen te trainen. Dat is toch een uh, belangrijke opmerking, een vraag die we veel krijgen, een belangrijk punt om mee te geven. Um, wij spreken over uh, Copilot with Commercial Data Protection. Hè. Dus met een bescherming van jullie data komen we op uh, uh, de punten die ik daarnet gezegd heb. Hè. Dus niet gebruikt om modellen te trainen en ook uh, die data wordt niet bewaard. Wat is er nu gisteren aangekondigd is dat die Copilot met die bescherming van jullie data beschikbaar komt voor uh, jullie, voor de studenten, voor jullie studenten. Dus de studenten in jullie tenant, um, daarvoor gaat de co-pilot ook beschikbaar komen. Die, die zullen, dat zal beschikbaar zijn vanaf uh, februari uh, 2024. Dus dat is eigenlijk een uh, aankondiging, een van de aankondigingen die we gisteren gedaan hebben. Dus dat de co-pilot zal uitgebreid worden, niet alleen naar de faculty um, in jullie omgeving, in jullie tenant, maar dat ook studenten uh, gebruik kunnen maken van die beschermde omgeving uh, die co-pilot uh, biedt. Dus dat is een eerste belangrijk puntje, een eerste belangrijke aankondiging. Voor alle duidelijkheid ook, dit, is, dit is bes gaat beschikbaar worden in jullie omgeving. Um, dit, is, uh, well, dit, dit zit in de licentieprijzen, dit zit allemaal dit zit er in, in begrepen. Um, voilà, daar heb ik het al over gehad. Hè. Dus jullie organisatie is beschermd. Um, er wordt informatie van op het web uh, gebruikt om... om, 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 om Copilot te gebruiken, maar nogmaals, uh, wordt, wordt niet bewaard en wordt, uh, niet, uh, uh, wordt niet gebruikt voor trainingsdoeleinden. Ik geef dit ook even mee. Um, dus jullie kunnen vandaag Copilot op verschillende plaatsen uh, uh, consulteren. Dat hebben jullie waarschijnlijk ongetwijfeld al gedaan. Hè? Maar nog even voor de duidelijkheid. Dus je kunt dat via Bing.com, via uw Edge browser, ook via de mobile app on Edge op Windows, nog niet voor iedereen misschien uh, beschikbaar vandaag, uh, en ook op copilot.microsoft.com. Uh, voilà. Uh, ik hoop dat jullie al een beetje zelf geëxperimenteerd hebben met, uh, met Copilot, uh, want het is echt wel, uh, ja, het zorgt wel voor efficiënties, het is echt wel cool wat jullie daar allemaal mee kunnen doen. Eerst dan een aantal voorbeelden, uh, je kan het gebruiken om samenvattingen te maken, je kan het gebruiken om, om e-mails, uh, om, om assistentie te krijgen, om e-mails te, te schrijven, uh, je kunt er heel gemakkelijk nieuwe beelden uh, mee genereren en die dan die de drie die daarachter zit, zorgt dat je heel gemakkelijk beelden kan uh, ook gaan genereren. Je kan er ook mee leren en, en het is ook gewoon een chatbot. Je kan er vragen aan stellen en antwoorden mee genereren. Dus ik raad jullie ten zeerste aan, mocht het nog niet gebeurd zijn, om er uh, mee aan de slag te gaan en op die manier ook uh, een beetje te experimenteren wat de mogelijkheden kunnen zijn uh, voor jullie uh, omgeving, uh, voor onderwijs. Voilà. Ik sta nu even stil bij het tweede stukje van de aankondiging van gisteren. Dus we hebben enerzijds aangekondigd dat Copilot beschikbaar is. Copilot met dataprotectie beschikbaar is voor studenten plus 18 vanaf februari. Maar een andere aankondiging die we gedaan hebben, of en een andere aankondiging die we gedaan hebben, is dat Copilot voor M365, dus eigenlijk uw Copilot functionaliteit ingebouwd in uw Microsoft 3. 60 omgeving, dat die beschikbaar is vanaf januari in jullie tenant, uh, gaat die beschikbaar zijn. Dus 
Wat, wat nog niet was voor onderwijs, is nu wel het geval en ook zeer snel. Het zal er al zijn in januari uh, dat je de co-pilot voor Microsoft 365 kan gebruiken in jullie Microsoft uh, Office 365 omgeving. Dat is wel met een kost. Hè. Dus dit is al een kost van 31 euro uh, eindgebruikersprijs per gebruiker per maand. Um, en daar is een minimum van 300 gebruikers per tent. Dus jullie gaan ook zien, ik weet niet of dat jullie al eerder aankondigingen hadden gezien rond uh, Copilot voor Microsoft 365. Uh, je ziet dat die prijssetting eigenlijk, uh, dat was een prijssetting die al gekend was. Dus uh, um, wij, um, uh, het, het komt dus aan een kost. Uh, er zit heel veel computekracht achter die uh, Copilot de, en, en dus vandaar dat we dat uh, gaan uh, aan deze prijs in de markt zetten, ook voor onderwijs. Dus 31 euro per maand per gebruiker. Als er mensen zijn die uh, vandaag interesse hebben om daarmee te starten of daarmee te, te experimenteren, uh, jullie weten mij te vinden, stuur me gerust een berichtje. Want eigenlijk kan dat vandaag, is dat, die beschikbaarheid is er. Daar is zelfs een SKU voor uh, beschikbaar. Dus dat kan vanaf vandaag uh, aangekocht worden. En dat kan vanaf januari in jullie tenant meegenomen worden. In dit overzicht zie je, um, zie je, zie je duidelijk wat dat de verschillende functionaliteiten zijn. En dus jullie hebben allemaal de publiek beschikbare Copilot voor persoonlijk gebruik. Er is de Copilot met commercial data protection. En dus daar is de aankondiging gekomen um, dat we die ook gaan openzetten naar plus 18-jarigen in een education tenant vanaf februari. En dan heb je de Copilot van Microsoft 365, waar dat je dus echt in de Microsoft 365 applicaties de integratie gaat hebben van Copilot. Ik zie dat Luc een vraag heeft. Luc? Ja, Lin. Um, is het de bedoeling of is het um, later de bedoeling dat de prijsstelling nog aangepast wo uh, gaat worden voor onderwijs? Want uh, 108000 euro op een jaar kan niemand betalen. Hè? Ja. Um... Dat is een goede vraag. Um, daar is momenteel geen, geen, geen zicht op. Um, dus ik denk eerlijk, allee, nee, daar, is, daar heb ik niet zo over gehoord dat dat nog zou bijgestuurd worden. Um, het is inderdaad um, het is zo dat dat zeer prijzig is. Daar zijn we ons ook van bewust. Um, ik denk dat uh, de, de, de redenering daarachter is dat, 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 dat de kost om uh, dit uh, te draaien, uh, het gemak gebruik van heel veel GPU-capaciteit, um, ook zeer hoog is. En vandaar dat we die prijszetting op die manier in de markt hebben gezet. Dus uh, nee, daar zijn geen berichten dat dat nog gaat aangepast worden. Maar dat kan alleen, dat, nee, geen info over. Oké. Okay, um, Goed, uh, voor de, ik heb, hier is een slide met de, met de next steps. So, dit is allemaal zeer recente informatie, in, informatie van gisteravond. Dus ik heb hier alvast alle handige documenten en resources uh, opgelijst. Um, dus uh, neem zeker een kijkje, we zullen de presentaties uiteraard delen. Um, maar hier ga je heel veel bijkomende informatie vinden over de aankondigingen en ook over hoe er mee te starten. Um, er is ook een adoption kit um, voor, uh, om, om, om mensen te begeleiden die ermee aan de slag willen. Dus ik denk dat dat ook zeer handig is. Dus um, jullie krijgen de presentatie, we zullen de linken delen. Um, voilà, ik weet niet of dat er nog vragen zijn over dit eerste stukje rond de co-pilot. Um, zijn er nog vragen? Er was nog een vraag in de chat over de uh, minimum van 300 seats per tenant, uh -huh. uh, of die ook individueel kunnen aangekocht worden. Uh, uh, nee, dus, dus um, nee, we zitten daar met een, een minimum aantal van 300, en, want individueel aankoop, ik hoop dat ik het gebruik. Nee, het is een minimum subset van 300 op tenant niveau. Dus ik weet niet goed, ik weet niet wie dat de vraag gesteld heeft, maar individueel wat je juist bedoelt. Um, uh, het is per gebruiker, hè? dus de licentie is per gebruiker en met een minimum van 300. Dus je had wel minimum 300 moeten aankopen. En nogmaals, we zijn ons bewust, dit is niet goedkoop, um, maar uh, ja, het is... Uh, 
de reële kost uh, achter de technologie is dat ook niet. Dus, uh, voilà. dus dat is een beetje de reden uh, waarom dat we dat aan deze prijs introduceren. Waren er nog vragen in de chat, Virginie? Uh, of... Nee, dat... nee Allee, de, we... de rest van de vragen is beantwoord, denk ik. Oké, okay, so we are all good to go. Um, then I would like to give the word to uh, my colleague Antoine, who is going to enlighten you on how to uh, develop, create chatbots with Azure OpenAI. Antoine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lynn. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry to switch back to English. Uh, my name is Antoine. Uh, I'm a technology strategist and um, I usually cover uh, public sector in uh, the south of the country. Uh, so I'll be able to talk a bit of the uh, few use cases there. Uh, so maybe I, I want to start with um, a short intro on, on how those models work and those models pro behind uh, the technology that um, is serving uh, co-pilots. So it's, it allows us to understand it's not black magic uh, and it's, it's, it's better to grasp. So today we'll be talking about uh, mostly LLMs or large language models. So those are, this is a subset of uh, generative AI where you can use uh, text info to produce either text, speech, uh, video, images. Uh, and then it's specifically designed for language. So we'll see what we can we can do with that. Uh, and then it also belongs into the deep learning category. Uh, and that's where we'll find the concept of neural networks. And I'll uh, touch a, a quick word on that uh, in a bit. So ChatGPT, you, know, you all know that tool. Uh, it's, it's nice to mention that it's developed by the company OpenAI, right? And it's based on, uh, on the models 3.5 Turbo for the free version when you go on ChatGPT uh, website. Uh, and the GPT-4 model, which are these elements uh, for the paid version. And so I said that those models, they're actually artificial neural networks. Uh, what does that mean? It means that um, when we try to, um, to understand uh, language, it's such a hard task that when we look in nature, what's the only thing that is capable of doing that? It's the human brain. And so the idea is to recreate an artificial version of the human brain with a neural network. And so each of these circles represents a neuron uh, similar to what we have in our brain. And then that neuron will receive an electric signal and it will decide based on parameters uh, if that signal goes to the next neighboring neurons or not. And so it's the addition of lots and lots of these really simple elements that makes us smart. And so that's a bit what we're trying to do uh, here with those LLMs uh, to, to tackle such complex tasks. And so, for example, uh, in the case of, uh, of GPT, uh, it, it takes it as input uh, some text. So Brussels is A. And then the signal will propagate through the uh, artificial neural network. Um, and so each neuron will decide based on some criteria if the signal goes to the next ones, yes or no. And then in the end, uh, what comes out, it's the most probable next token or next word, if you will. And so in this case, Brussels is a city. Uh, I could do a zoom uh, on, on, on how those things work, but just bear in mind, it's super simple. Uh, it's just uh, essentially pluses and uh, times, right? So you multiply it and uh, you, you do some additions uh, and, and and uh, the design of, of, of when the signal will go through or not and so on, that's, that's a bit what the, the data scientists work on, on those models. Oh, this one is... All right, so if we look a bit at the, the size, uh, the magnitude of, of these models, if we look at GPT 3.5, um, so we have 175 billion parameters. All right. So there is first a training phase during which we will be tweaking all these parameters so that the model will behave as we want it to behave. All right. So we'll feed that model during the training phase with lots of words. In the case of 3.5, it was around 300 billion words. Uh, and then we'll be, we're tweaking these parameters so that it's the output of the model seems like human language and seems really probable and, and has reasonable thinking and, and so on. There is a human supervision piece on top of those models. So during the, the training phase, again, uh, we had humans 
looking at, okay, this is this answer is better than this one, ranking those answers uh, in order to tweak those parameters even further. Just bear in mind that uh, GPT 3.5, for example, uh, at some point, the training phase ends, uh, and then the model is fixed and will never change anymore. And then it's it's used uh, to build products on top, such as ChatGPT. And so the training data stopped in September 2021. So when you ask questions to GPT 3.5, uh, it wasn't able to give you answers that are recent because that's when the training stopped uh, and then the model was then fixed. In the case of GPT-5, um, we're talking about trillion parameters. And the interesting thing we see here uh, with our research departments uh, is that the more you add parameters uh, to, to those models, it's a bit similar to human brains. Um, then we start to see new cognitive capabilities appearing. And so we have models that become a lot smarter uh, than the previous ones. Good to mention as well that for GPT-4, uh, it's a multi-model. Uh, which means that as input, it not only takes text, but it takes uh, it can take uh, speech uh, and images, even videos. All right, so we talked a bit about GPT, uh, to generate and understand text. Um, OpenAI developed other models, among which we have Whisper, very interesting one to, um, to study. It does a speech to text transcription. And it does it really well. So I have customers that, um, that have projects using Whisper. And so when you have meetings, for example, where multiple people speak at the same time, when you have people speaking in Dutch, some in French, that model is really able to, uh, to get everything that was said in the meeting with high accuracy. They also developed Dolly uh, for image generation. For those who haven't played with Dolly, it's quite fun to play. Uh, so for example, I can ask, give me a picture of a dog wearing a hat in the colors of the Belgian flag. And you see that the model really understood uh, what I meant. Uh, and then it generates an image that didn't exist before, before I asked this, right? By the way, you can try this out for free um, if you go to bing.com slash create. Um, and then we can go even a, a step further. I can ask the same picture, but then I want it, because we're in an education context here, uh, I want it to be sitting in a classroom while it's training outside. And you see it really has the concept of the classroom, the rain, the rain on the window. It's quite impressive on how it has an internal representation of what I meant. So this, that's why we start to see some intelligence in those models. Why do I talk to you about OpenAI? That is because Microsoft and OpenAI have a, have a partnership. The partnership is mainly threefold. First of one, obviously, is capital investment that we provided to, to OpenAI. Second one is, as you saw, the scale of these models. We need quite complex infrastructure to run those. And so that runs on Azure, right? And then the third one, that's the most interesting piece for today, uh, is the fact that we have exclusive access to their models. What does that mean? Oh, I can skip this. It, mean that, it means that um, they develop the models, but we can take them Run, it, run them ourselves in our own uh, data centers and operate them and build services on top of them. It means that when you, um, when you uh, like uh, Lean Sedan, when you start using co-pilots, when you start using some, some uh, AI services in Azure, we will never be sending your data over to OpenAI. And that's what others do. As we have that exclusive partnership, we can keep your data and, and, and ensure some guardrails and security on top of that. So what do we do with these models? Uh, mostly two things. Uh, uh, as Lynn uh, mentioned earlier in the call, uh, we do infuse them into our applications. So that can be Microsoft 365, that can be GitHub, that can be LinkedIn, that can be uh, Dynamics 365. Uh, in order to improve uh, user productivity satisfaction. But we also built some tools for you to build your own applications using, using these technologies. And that's more meant to developers or IT folks. Uh, and that's what I'll be showing today, what you could do very easily uh, with those tools. All right, so that I just picked 
three key highlights, uh, again, on the fact that uh, we operate those models ourselves. It means that uh, also we can have our fundamental principles applied because it's our operations. And, and some of those are the data belongs to you and only you. Your data is not used to train the models and the data is protected by our compliance and security mechanisms. For example, we have ways to ensure that when you interact with these GPT models, uh, that your data only stays in the EU, for example. Let's look at um, the strengths of LLMs, huh? large language models. Uh, so LLMs are really good at searching for information. And here we talk really about semantic searching. So it's not keyword matching. Uh, so for example, um, if I have a document that talks about um, the vaccination of pets, and I ask a question, uh, do I need to have my cat uh, injected? It will find the right document, even though those are not the same words, it will understand the semantic behind and the fact that it's, it means the same or it means it's close in the meaning. And so it will retrieve the right information. It's really good, um, good to perform summarization and analysis. Uh, I can talk about classification as well. So when you have a text that comes in unstructured, maybe poorly written, it's able to classify. So uh, I, I understand that there is this piece of information in this text, and um, that piece and that piece. So you can start to structure unstructured data with those models. It's good for ideation and creative help. So obviously human is more creative in the end, but it's a, it's a good starter. And so when you have that blank page, uh, it can give you ideas so that you can iterate on those. Really good, good for proofreading, for text generation, as well as a task automation. It's also good to look at the, um, the weaknesses as well. Uh, so these models, they do come with hallucinations. So you, you can't be certain of what comes out. And we have ways to limit those, and I'll talk about it uh, in a minute. But it's it's good to know, right? Uh, it doesn't. It's not good at analytical thinking. We also have ways to counter this. So don't ask these models to, to make complex analytical tasks. Uh, they are not good at it. And that's why, for example, when you look at OpenAI with the uh, ChatGPT Plus, you have plugins. So when you ask for a math problem, it will then ask Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha, for example, to do the math problem because the model itself is not trained on, on numbers. It has biases on the training data that we provided during the, the training phase uh, is, is data that has mostly occidental and, and we do our best to, to prevent those biases, but there, there are some biases and it's good to know. It's hard to for those models to be replicable. So meaning that if you ask the same question two times, you will not get the same answer uh, coming out of it. And then explainability. Uh, we These models are so big in size that it's hard to understand really what's the internal reasoning in the model to come out with the answer it comes out with which is just for an interesting fact there um, so the researchers are at OpenAI. they are trying to understand how those work right so what they did is um, they are using gpt4 that huge model to understand uh, gpt2 so now it's trying we're starting to to understand but still uh, some some unknown there so I was talking about uh, analytical thinking. So what we do at Microsoft to prevent that, for example, let's say you have this balance sheet document that you need to analyze. You can ask GPT to extract the data in more usable ways, for example, in Markdown or even in JSON. So that's more interesting for the developers out there. Uh, but you'll notice that in the uh, extracted information, you might have hallucination on the numbers. And so in the balance sheet, there was, um, for example, here, uh, 30,601. Uh, what was taken out from uh, GPT-4 Turbo with Vision uh, is 3,061. So what we do at uh, Microsoft is we, um, we combine different models to do different purposes. So as soon as we spot a number, we'll use our own models to, um, to read those numbers to make sure that there is no mistakes on numbers. And we don't want mistakes on numbers when you start to do things like BI and so on. All right, the other uh, limitation that I mentioned was hallucination uh, on text. 
So the way we do it, and that's uh, on, on this that I prepared a demo for you, uh, is the fact that these models, they have mostly two sides. They have a cognitive abilities. So really the capability of uh, reasoning, understanding, generating uh, understandable text. Uh, so those are our cognitive abilities. But they also have internal knowledge. All the training data that was used during the training phase, uh, it's, it's, it's knowledge, right? So you can ask the models to what it knows and what it doesn't know. And that's why when you used ChatGPT, there was a limit of September 2021 because of that. So the way we uh, approach this problem is to say, okay, let's not look at the internal knowledge and only use those models for their cognitive abilities. And I'll show you um, how we do that in a bit. And so thanks to this, we can build a private ChatGPT that is fed with documents that we choose. And for this, I, um, I, I took an example of, uh, of uh, Oculus Condorcet. It's based in, uh, in Eno. Uh, and then I put myself in the, in the shoes of, um, of a student living in, fr in France that wants to register to the school to learn uh, physio physiotherapy. And so I will do a quick demo. All right, so I built this chat tool. Uh, you'll see that uh, it's not quite sexy, but that can you can imagine that this can be put onto a website, surfaced through Teams, whatever, right? So this is just a, an interface that is not sexy, but the, the goal of the demo is to show you the chat capabilities. In this case, I also enabled Whisper, which is, uh, as I explained in the beginning, uh, the speech to text uh capabilities so i can ask my questions uh, to the chat by uh, by uh, speaking so that's what i'll do i'd like to register to uh the physiotherapy uh, degree what should i know first of all you see how accurate even though i have a quite a heavy french accent you see uh, quite accurate the transcription of what i said was so I'd like to register to the physiotherapy degree, which I know. And then uh, the chat here will give me uh, a really understandable and really clean uh, answer. So to register to the physiotherapy degree at Haute École Condorcet, you must hold either a certificate d'enseignement secondaire supérieur, a certificate de diploma from the enseignement de promotion sociale, or a foreign degree whose equivalence is recognized, blah, 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 blah. And you see the interesting piece here is, is giving me references. And so I can even consult the references to make sure that what comes out is, is accurate. All the documents that I fed in were in French, by the way. I asked my question in French and gave me an English answer that was constructed on French documents. So that's another interesting capabilities of those models is they're by, by essence, uh, they can speak multiple languages. Uh, and the fact that is, uh, Oops, started a new conversation. Let me just ask this one again. And you'll see here that is not replicable. So you see, I don't exactly have the same answer as, as above. Right? Uh, and it's also conversational, right? So I can say I'm a French student or I live in France. Let's speak it. I live in France. it will keep the context, right? So I still want to register to the physiotherapy degree. Wait, so it's not replicable, so my demo. Uh, so I live in France. Is there anything I should know? And then it, it understood um, the fact that I'm a non-resident of Belgium. And so it gave me details on, on what to do to apply when, uh, when for non-residents. And you also see that um, it gave me the, the sources. Uh, are there, is there, let me speak it. Is there a maximum number of non-residents that can apply to the physiotherapy degree?
And so again, uh, give me a really clear answer, um, saying that um, it, there is indeed a cap, but uh, it doesn't have the information on, on how much exactly. I can continue my conversation. Is there any student housing available? And again, let me just scroll down. And then again, it tells me that there is student housing available. Uh, give me where they are and so on. And again, I have access to the right information. All right. So how we how did we build this? Uh, essentially, it took me uh, what's twenty minutes. Um, if we had to build a chatbot uh, only a year ago, uh, it would have been quite complex, right? Because the way you build chatbot is, first of all, you need to understand what's the intent of the user. So there is an intent recognition. Uh, it's it's off, it was often based on, on simple AI models or even keyword matching. And when you notice the intent, then you have one branch per intent where the conversation flow is decided upon and designed upon, right? In this case, it was a lot easier. The way this works is the user asks the question, and, and it, we don't let that user speak directly to the LLM to the right, right? So we first go through an orchestrator. What does the orchestrator does do? It will do a semantic search on the knowledge base we provided, which are the websites, PDF documents with all the FAQs, whatever you decide, uh, you can you can tie feed in the knowledge base. Semantic search again, it's really looking at what's close in the meaning, right? So so it's smart search, it's not simple um, key keyword matching. With the results of that semantic search on our knowledge base, the system will build a prompt that is invisible to the end user. Right, and the prompt is composed of many three things: the behavior and instructions to the bot. So we'll tell them how to behave, what what topics to answer on, what topics not to to cover, and so on. We'll give it the results of that semantic search, and we'll tell it, uh, all right, build your answer based on those pieces of documents where we think the answer might be. And obviously, we'll also give it the conversation with the user. It can be one question or it can be the full conversation so that we, we keep the context. We send that mega prompt to the LLM. The LLM will produce an answer. And, and let's take a look at the prompt uh, on, on my example here. So the instructions. So you are an AI assistant who helps potential future students at Hôtel Condorcet. You answer questions about study programs, enrollment conditions, procedures, blah, blah, blah. We also, I also tell it to answer the, in the language of the question. Hence, it answered me in English when I was asking questions in English. And then build your answer based on the below information. And this is where we have the results from the semantic search. So from the knowledge base. And then the question from the user, I'd like to register to the physiotherapist degree, what's your name? Once the LLM produces an answer, um, we'll go through the orchestrator again. So we'll make sure that uh, the content is safe according to our guidelines. So it's not insulting or whatever if we decided that it can't. We'll make sure that the content is quite accurate and we'll do a search again on the knowledge base to make sure to, to be able to give the, the sources of where each sentence uh, what information it was using from the knowledge base. So that's how we give the sources to the answer. And then only we provide the answer to the end user. So that's how we prevent hallucination and how we tie uh, those models into a specific context that you define. And so if I go back to my demo, uh, when I say that I build this in 20 minutes, I really didn't lie. Uh, so I have, this is the admin view. So on the left, I have my system prompt where I uh, define my behavior. Um, I added my database where I had, it can be again, a website or a list of documents. For me, it was a, a bunch of PDFs that I extracted from their website. 
Uh, and then I also have access to uh, the parameters of the model. And so I can decide I want to use GPT 3.5, how many messages I want to be included. Um, and then I can choose the temperature. So how creative the model will come up uh, will be when providing answers and so on. And so that's something you can uh, do really quickly, and then you can deploy it either to a web app, web app or uh, to a Power Virtual Agent, now called Copilot, uh, in the Copilot Studio. Any questions so far? I'm not monitoring the chat, but I guess uh, nothing in the chat yet, Antoine. Okay, top. Feel free to ask questions. I didn't mention it yet. Uh, in in here. Um, I just took um, a few minutes to list, uh, from my point of view, what could be really interesting generative AI use cases in education. And I sorted them in, uh, in four categories, uh, looking at productivity of the staff, uh, designing of teaching material, learning uh, really on the student side, and then student services. And the demo I just showed you, uh, helping students to navigate through different procedures, and that's, that's in here. But uh, interesting, so you could do the same uh, for staff. Uh, we can look at content translation, support for comms team. Uh, so really the comms teams that have to generate a lot of text, they can, can have a, a big help with these models. Doing meeting minutes. So being able to, during a meeting, you, you capture the audio, you send it through a whisper, you get a full transcript. From that transcript, you can then ask these models to generate minutes based on a specific format that you have in your own uh, institution, for example. Routing and prioritization of request complaints. So you might have complaints coming in. Uh, it's really good at understanding the topic behind and routing that to the right person. Classification of unstructured information. Uh, I don't know if when you, when you rate students, all these comments from teachers, we could have we could build dashboards on uh, is, is there a bias in the way the teacher um, comments the students what is the most what is the soft skill that needs to be addressed i don't know i'll let your creativity come up uh, support from it teams so these models they're really good at understanding human language uh, but they're even better at understanding uh, development language and so it teams can have huge boost uh, by using by using this technology Teaching materials. Yes. Sorry, I'm gonna disturb. This um, people no, no are wondering what license they need to build this uh, chatbot. It's a it's a pay as you go uh, type of scheme. Uh, so it's on Azure. So it's it's essentially Azure credits. Uh, and then the more you use it, the more you have to pay. And it's the way the model works. Pricing model is it's a uh, it's a fraction of a cent per token but um with the use case that i'm working with with my customers it's it's really not expensive for example uh, we're looking at um, citizen facing chatbot in the south um it's it's fifty thousand euros per year citizen facing yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thanks, Antoine. And just to com to comment on uh, to clarify uh, because I saw it in the chat. Um, so what I presented on on Copilot, I mean this is completely separate from 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 what is Antoine is is presenting. So Copilot, everything what is built in, what is available, what you don't build yourself, that is available for Microsoft. That is um, or free of charge, as I mentioned, or um, the, the Copilot from 365 is, is, is paid and therefore you have, those, uh, have to buy those licenses with a minimum of 300. This is Azure, so this is on a completely different platform. This is Azure, so you can leverage your Azure subscription for that um, to get access to OpenAI. And if you need, I just want to say, if you need help, if you are interested to start with this, just uh, send send me a, a quick email um, to, to to get you started because there are some things that we need to take into consideration to get you started. So, Antoine, Indeed. Okay. So um, two big categories of use cases, right? So the first one is we give a general purpose copilot to users so that they can they can find ways to 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 best work with them and improve 
their productivity and uh, and, and work life balance uh, whatever so that's this category right that's where we embed that technology in our tools or or that could be ChatGPT on the open ai set right so that general productivity category uh, where you it's ready to use and it can it can cover pretty much any task but then keep in mind it's best to um, to help the users uh, on board and, and guide them a bit on, on what are the best prompts to use and 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 be aware of hallucinations and so on. Then the other category is when you have a more specific use case, a business flow or a specific problem you want to tackle, then we can look at building something specifically meant for that. And that would then be more uh, your IT teams uh, working on on those. Uh, and that's the example I showed. And that's more Azure services, where you have a specific problem, we build a specific answer to that problem ourselves, uh, and then we make it available to the end users. Uh, and then there, uh, we can put even more guardrails around, so, so it might require less user adoption and, and onboarding. All right, come back to this one. So uh, on the learning side, um, so really, uh, no, I was here. Uh, so helping teachers design their uh, teaching material. So I uh, I spoke with a lot of teachers over the past months, and uh, and some of them told me it's really a great help when designing a course. So I need to teach about this topic. I have 60 hours. These are my students. How should I articulate my course? And giving an outline, and then the teacher obviously will change and add and, and then fill it with content. We can look at scenarios when we can develop personalized learning based on learner profile, right? So each learner is different. So we could have the content, different content addressed to them based on, based on who they are. Can be a great illustration assistance with Dolly. Uh, can be a great support for correction, um, great for content generation exercises, examples, metaphors. On the student side, it's really good at reformulating, explaining concepts, and it has an infinite patience, huh? what, what we don't have. Uh, it's good at simplifying, contextualizing explanations. It's good at generating summaries of maybe long, long explanation books or whatever. Uh, we could even think about making a Q&A tool based on course content. And then student services. We could even look at um, helping students with orientation. So that's something we are doing in the one of my customers as well. Is they have a lot of open positions, so it's more business context. But they have a lot of uh, open positions, and then a lot of uh, job seekers applying to um, to open positions. We're looking at making better matching between what the job seeker likes and what is his capabilities in terms of soft skills and so on and what the uh, resume is, is the same. So that's that's things we can definitely do. So my invitation for you is uh, try it out already in a more general context, but uh, with Copilot. If you go to bing.com slash chat, you can already use that. Also, uh, since I have an education audience in front of me, uh, it's you have, I think, the, the greatest challenge of, of all huh, when it comes to teaching AI is is training uh, the the current generation of learner on, on new skills, because from the survey we conduct uh, around the world, uh, we have we we saw that eighty two percent of leaders said that their employees will need new skills to be prepared uh, prepared for that new era coming up, and then we listed uh, the skills that will be needed, and so it's it's going to be a different set of skills that that we're training we're getting trained today. Huh? So it's it's really about how can I incorporate AI in my day to day? Uh, how can I better judge what comes out of it? Uh, how do I understand? Uh, how do I know if, if what comes out is real or not? I need to search, I need to, to criticize and so on. So, so those are new skill sets that we need to focus on. And then I also wanted to uh, give you a couple examples on um, on the multimodality of GPT-4, uh, because it opens a lot of new doors as well. So for example, you can put in a video as input 
And here it's a commercial for a car, and we ask for the summarization of the commercial. And you see that it's really able to understand the commercial and gives me a summary of what the commercial is about. So you can start having video as input. And then you can start making changes. Huh? Uh, so can you suggest changes that would be appropriate from the Christmas period? Uh, and then as it's able to generate images and video and so on, uh, it, it can also uh, provide those suggestions. Let's take a more uh, practical example. Uh, we've all rented a car. Uh, I guess most of us, we take pictures of our car when we uh, leave it out to make sure that if they say we did a dent, uh, that we have proof that we didn't. Imagine here, we can just film the car and then input it in those models. And then you'll have, we tell the model, okay, uh, you're an expert evaluating car damage for the car accidents, blah, blah, blah. And then it will give us, uh, the, it will recognize the model of the car, the car make, uh, and then all the, the rear side, right side of the blue Toyota Camry has sustained significant damage characterized by deep scratches and scuff marks. So you see how precise it is. I think that's, that's all sort of work we, we no longer have to do manually. All right, that was it for me. Uh, I guess we can open the floor for questions. Yes, and Antoine, there was a question from uh, uh, from Stan um, on how does Copilot Studio fit in here in, in what you just uh, presented. So Copilot Studio is essentially the rebranding of Power Virtual Agent, which is a tool to create chatbots in a low-code, no-code way, right? Um, we've added, when we rebranded re it to Copilot Studio, we've added a lot of uh, Gen AI capabilities uh, and, and also modules so that you can link it to a SharePoint site and so on. So essentially, when you need to design a bot, the question is, uh, do I want to go the low-code way? Because then uh, I can design it very easily. I don't need to have um, data scientists. I don't need to have developers helping me designing the bot. But then just know that uh, if you want, if you have a high level of personalization, customization, then you'll be a bit more limited, right? So it's easier, but more standard. Or you say, okay, uh, I have the skills, I have developers, I have data, AI, um, I have data scientists, data scientists, and so on. So you can go the pro development way. And, and that would, just, and then there we have a lot of uh, Azure services. For example, the AI studio on Azure and so on. You can also mix the two. And, and that's uh, interesting. So I mentioned already, uh, there's a, a chatbot that we're building in, in Wallonia uh, that will be public facing. Um, we're mixing the two because the administration doesn't want to have the bots, uh, the citizens directly interact with the Gen AI models. So we have. What we did is uh, the AI team, the data team, uh, they, they have a, a more pro development tool that they work on where they, uh, they have really prompting the, the way they want. They have multiple models so they can compare the uh, what comes out of them and select who's best and so on. So they built a tool that is then in the hands of the business. The business then uses that tool to generate conversations based on the internal knowledge base as well. And then those conversations are put in into uh, Copilot Studio. So you have business on the one side managing the chatbot, and then you have the developers and the data scientists on the other side, really shaping the models uh, with more uh, with more specialized tooling. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, Stan had another question. Um, so on the what you demonstrated here and on today, uh, therefore then you you used the the Azure. Um, um, the AI so I use studio, the, uh, the I use the Azure Open AI Studio, but everything is merged into the AI Studio. It was announced uh, at Ignite. I think it was three weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Timothy asked a question on, and I know it was the case like until recently, but maybe not anymore. If you want to start using Azure Open AI, you still need to uh, fill out a form and ask access to be able to use those services, correct? That is correct. Um, 
So there's a simple form. You need to explain a bit what you intend on doing, uh, who you are, what organization you're part of. Uh, it usually takes three days to, uh, to, to be accepted. The reason is um, we're really looking at how our AI is used. So we want to have control on, on not giving it to the in bad hands. So that's a bit, we're filtering out a bit the request this way. OK, thanks. Um, I'm not um, sure, but I don't think we have. Um, I think there was one more question. If um, you could use a SharePoint, SharePoint environment to create a chatbot. Yeah, definitely. Um, again, two ways. So either you go the no local way uh, in Copilot Studio, uh, there is a connector to SharePoint. So you can imagine having a knowledge bridge on, on the SharePoint site, you connect it to, to your Copilot. Or you go the Azure way, where you uh, you make a, a connector as well. So in, in, in both ways, it's possible. Perfect. Um, I don't think there were any more questions. Can I ask a question uh, to audio? Um, maybe I missed it from the start because I, I joined late. Um, but uh, Antoine, you mentioned uh, you accept uh, uh, demands for starting this, like, uh, and you're filtering and make sure that you give this out to uh, the proper people. How do we can apply for a kind of a sandbox uh, for? For me, as a lecturer, uh, to use that in my my classes with students. Uh, so, in when it comes to pricing, uh, I, I maybe give the the way to lean because I don't know if there is any sandboxing mechanisms in Edu. So, my my second question was also: Is there any sponsored or free uh, sandbox available to do this? In my market, there isn't. Okay, but I don't know about Edu. Well. It's a good question. Um, I uh, I need to check because I, I only saw it yesterday, the starter kit that I mentioned in the slides, whether we have the possibility to test it. I thought there was going to be a, a, a kind of a fast track scenario as well, but I'll come back to that. Uh, so, so let me uh, go after it and, and, and get some clarity. So whenever we uh, send the slides, we will make sure that that question gets answered as well. Okay, and just to, to, to finalize my questions, uh, can you give me or post somewhere some uh, uh, direct links into the uh, Microsoft Learn to start yeah, learning about this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for the question. We will um, add them then in the slides as well. Yes. Co pilot okay. for higher ed, also for K-12. I think, uh, Ilian, it's uh, available for K-12 as well, but it's the same regulations. Ali, you have to uh, buy 300 seats. It's per tenant. Yes, and what I, it's 100% it's correct, Virginie, um, what I maybe, uh, what I haven't mentioned. Um, so we, we, we announced yesterday that uh, we are, as of February, we will make it available for students as of 18. Um, and then probably the question popped up, okay, what with students under 18? So we are currently still uh, investigating that on how we will work with that. So um, yes, we are looking into that. Um, we are working on it, but but so far no updates from that. But 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 know that we are working on that on what to do to make it available uh, for students under uh, 18 as well. So yeah, whenever we have updates on that, we will let you know. Okay, thank you. And then maybe to close off, uh, Rashid is here as well. Um, he's um, working at our MTC. Uh, and he wants to show uh, the meeting recap option in Copilot uh, to you, if that's OK. To close off. So, Hi, Rashid. everyone. Good, uh, good morning. Yes, let me. Uh, but I cannot share my screen, I see. Oh, I will check. Yeah. I made you a presenter, Rashid. Thank you for that. Perfect. So I just. Thank you, Antoine. Yes. Voila. 
So uh, what I show here on the right one is uh, the co-pilot for Teams. Uh, and we have the, that functionality of intelligent uh, recap. Uh, and I just, uh, just 10 minutes before the end of the meeting, uh, co-pilot kicked in and he proposed me already to generate uh, some meeting notes. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, what uh, Antoine talked about, so he gives a nice summary uh, uh, what Lean presented, what Antoine talked about, yeah. Um, and uh, what is also nice here is that some action points were defined during this session, and you can see it here. Uh, uh, I think uh, there is one for Lean to do, uh, checking the license requirements. It was a, uh, an ask from uh, Luc, I see here. And then the third one uh, was about uh, chat development. Huh? Okay, so uh, for those people uh, who were not able to follow the full uh, session uh, of today, there is that nice meeting recap functionality where you can uh, find back the most discussed topics and some action items. Uh, a nice example of co-pilot and how to uh, increase at the end your productivity every day. Voila, Virginie. That's it. Thank you, Rashid. Don't show. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Look, we, we will stop. We will stop uh, showing <laughs> things. Uh, uh, reacting on the comment of Luke in the chat. Um, okay, good. Um, any a last call for questions? If If we don't have... Any questions? Uh, and that is correct, Natalie. 100% um, correct. The intelligent recap is under Teams Premium as well. Correct. Um, okay, so if there are no further questions, then I really want to thank you um, to making some time to, to follow the webinar. I hope um, it, it, it helped you uh, getting more a glimpse of what is possible with Copilot, Copilot for M365, but also and especially with OpenAI. Um, so let me know if you uh, send me, drop me an email if you want to have access to Azure OpenAI, if you want to get started, if you're interested in knowing more, if you want to uh, are interested in the Copilot for M365, just send me a quick note and uh, I'll come back to it. And um, yeah, probably this is uh, probably the last meeting of this uh, this year. Uh, so I, I all want to wish you a uh, um, yeah a Merry Christmas and a good uh, good festivities for the end of the year and enjoy especially your uh, your holidays. Um, so um, thank you. Looking forward to to see to, to hear from you and um, and to see you back in uh, in uh, in January. Thank you all, and thanks Antoine, Virginie, Rashid for uh, for the help and for all your contributions to this session. Thank you.